I, I want to say something about the fast food workers' action yesterday. Um, it's difficult for me to do that, frankly, because there's a dearth of information. Um, uh, yesterday was about the sixth, I think, action. One day strike, one day work stoppage, uh, national work stoppage of fast food workers. Uh, it took place in 150 cities. Some of us participated in it here. Uh, our comrades and friends were in it from Durham, North Carolina, to Philadelphia, to Chicago, to Los Angeles. Um, uh, and this time they engaged in civil disobedience. Uh, where we were in Times Square yesterday, uh, a group of uh, fast food workers in front of the McDonald's, where there was a crowd of about 500 workers and supporters, they sat in the streets, they blocked traffic. And I think they did that other ways. But other places, they, uh, they occupied stores. Sometimes they occupied business lobbies. Several hundred, thousands of workers took place, and at least several hundred workers were arrested. And uh, while I don't have all the information, what little information we do have uh, leads me the confident impression that it was a pretty successful action where they stepped forward, and that is the civil disobedience. Also, in some cities, and this was new, um, home health care workers who are also paid, you know, just insulting, ridiculous poverty wages, took part in this. Some of them actually walking off their job. You know, so it, 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 it's so wonderful, and I'm so glad that they did that, even though the numbers, I imagine, were symbolic of home health care workers. It's because this is, while the, the, the center of this low-wage worker struggle is clearly the fast food workers, uh, perhaps now even more so than the Walmart workers, because they're just ubiquitous, they're all over the place, and all those terrible chains that serve that bad, expensive food and pay their workers nothing, you know, uh, and treat them terribly. Uh, but clearly this is not just about the fast food workers. It's about the growing ranks of low-wage workers regardless where they work, you know. Uh, one thing I, I think some of the comrades from the Dis Disability Caucus uh, would be satisfied with this. You know, there was a, there was a big conference of fast food workers in early July in Chicago. And they actually raised there this issue of, uh, um, uh, uh, what is it, what is it, Eddie? Uh, um, disabled workers. Uh, there, there are laws that allow bosses to pay disabled workers sub-minimum wages. And from what I heard about the conference, they have actually taken this up as an issue. Sometimes it's as little as half, half the minimum wage. You know, talk about super exploitation, you know. Um, I mean, I looked through all the bourgeois news that I'm familiar with, and if you search, you could find it somewhere in the Times, somewhere on USA Today. But considering how big it was and how important it was, you know, uh, it should have been more prominent. You certainly could find the news about Joan Rivers dying, you know, which may be important to some people. And a lot of, and of course, a lot about ISIS and, you know, the, uh, the NATO meeting in, in Wales, which, of course, is important. But they put that, they, they have a line on that. So they, they, they push that with their own propaganda. But they don't want to tell the masses about these brave low-wage workers rising up because they don't want to give the masses any idea. Because if they can do it, maybe it can be done somewhere else. Comrades, you know, even if this struggle, this tremendous struggle of the fast food workers uh, ended, at least for the moment, today, you would have to admit that it has already achieved a great deal. They've already won a lot. They, they, just like the immigrants in 2006 who, you know, came from being invisible but 
shut down a lot of uh, big sections of industry in this country, especially on the West Coast. You know, that uprising in 2006 during May Day, it, it made them, made the, the invisible become visible. What's happened over the past two years, in a way, has done the same thing for fast food and low wage workers, many of whom happen to be immigrants and women and black and brown young people people of, of every generation. Uh, the, the issue of the how low they're paid and how badly they're treated is known. And, and their plight is popular. And it has been driving McDonald's and Burger King and KFC and the bankers that invest in them crazy because even from the point of view of a public relations battle, they've just been losing, you know. But clearly it can't stop. It's too important. It's not going to stop. And the question becomes, what next? Where do we go from here? And as excited as I am about talking on and on about what happened yesterday and what happened on May 15th when there was a worldwide strike of fast food workers. You know, by the way, some of us went to a meeting at 1199, sort of a break meeting, you know, after they did oh, Times Square and before they went on to other things. And what was interesting about that was that uh, as part of this sort of informal program, they had representatives of fast food workers from Europe from the Caribbean and from Asia come and speak. And that's just, you know, talk about consciousness. It's so great, you know, you got a worker gets up with a, with a, with a, a, a different accent and they said, I, I came here. Also, also, one of the leading organizers deliberately came from Ferguson, Missouri to participate in the New York action. But I, I'm, I'm more interested in the questions. There are a lot of questions that the movement and everybody who's concerned with this must grapple with. Uh, my experience is that even amongst the most militant activists oriented toward the trade unionists or inside the trade unionists, and certainly those of us who you know, work with the trade unionists is at best peripheral and we, maybe we're in the anti-war movement or the anti-racist movement or the LGBT or something like that. It becomes very difficult to talk about the problems of the labor movement because right away it's very difficult not to get either frustrated or angry or, you know, why are we beating our heads against the wall? It's never going to change. The leadership is too tied to the Democratic Party. It's too moderate. No matter, no matter what danger the workers are in, they, they don't seem that they're going to break with the Democratic Party and break with the, you know, losing, you know, moderate, given conciliation uh, uh, political strategy. Uh, uh, we feel helpless. There's nothing we could do. I mean, if we could do something that would make an impact, maybe we could talk about it. You know, this is the, the, the thinking, the mindset. Uh, and, and it's understandable on a psychological level because people generally want to concern themselves with things uh, that they can have an impact on. You know, we may not be able to have an impact on the problems in the labor movement. They just, they seem, they seem to just, you know, too big for us. But we can do something in other mo movements, something smaller, something that we can digest. I understand all that, comrades. But I still say as revolutionaries, we have to deal with these difficult questions. We have to make sure that we don't get frustrated and we don't, and it doesn't affect our morale, you know, and, and, and we're not turned off by the problems of the working class. We want to embrace the workers. But I'm convinced that no matter how difficult the questions are, we are duty bound to deal with them because Ultimately, we are a big part of the answer. What questions am I talking about? You look at the low wage worker struggle. And this is not putting down any of the huge worker struggles that are going on anywhere against austerity, 
against attempts to break unions, certainly the struggle of our valiant comrades and friends in Boston, which, uh, you know, is, according to the comrades there, is actually uh, on the upswing. Let's cross our fingers. And more than that, let's support it, you know. But this low-wage worker uprising must be considered the most important labor struggle in this country and arguably the world. Why? One, it's huge. It involves hundreds of thousands of workers, potentially. Two, it's not just about fast food workers or even retail workers. The outcome of this battle to organize the fast food workers has direct meaning for all low wage workers. It is the thing that can revive the labor movement based on the mass organization of low wage workers who are more and more predominant through our class. So both classes are looking at it. A lot sets stake. And so you have to ask yourself, as wonderful as the workers are doing and as brave as they are, why aren't they getting more support? You know, why weren't there more of us out there at 6 a.m.? I'm not talking about comrades. I'm talking about why wasn't there, you know, thousands of union members and uh, community organizations and so forth, you know. Uh, is some of it the union's fault, the Service Employees International Union? I'm sure that it is. You know, uh, the leadership of SEIU is, is not militant. Uh, they are important because that union, I think, is the biggest union now. If I'm mistaken, someone can correct me. And moreover, they have more of the service workers, that, you know, comparatively, than any of the other unions. They have more of the immigrant workers, you know. Uh, but they are, you know, a business unionism, top-down unionism. They're not, they're not a militant rank-and-file union. Although, if, ultimately, if they keep on bringing in these workers, that will change the culture. That will radicalize the culture, you know, and wouldn't, wouldn't that be great? You know, it's not like, you know, SEIU put out a call, all radicals, all revolutionary communists, all revolutionary class warriors, you know, take your positions on the battlefield. We need you, you know. No, it's not that, you know. As a matter of fact, they're not happy to see some of us. But you know what? That's their problem. That's their problem. They're, they're, they're putting a lot of resources into this, and certainly they have a say. But... We cannot, and when I say we, I talk about the movement. We cannot behave toward this struggle as though it has nothing to do with us and it's all about them. And because we weren't given, you know, a engraved invitation to come, then we should just sit on the sidelines because we're frustrated and because we don't like the labor leadership and yada, yada, yada. You know, this is just an excuse to, you know, retreat from the battlefield when the battle is getting hotter and hotter. This message has to get to the movement. Why isn't Labor Day, the Labor Day demonstration tomorrow in New York, which some of us will be going to, why isn't that dedicated to low-wage workers? You know? It's not taking anything away from workers who are making a relatively good salary. Every class conscious worker who's making a, who has a union and is making a relatively good union wage knows that the ticket to keeping what they have fought hard for is by being in solidarity with these low wage workers because if they if they don't do that then the low wage workers will be pitted against them that is the name of the game again this is the most important struggle it affects everybody, not just the union bureaucrats who seem to be having all the say, you know? I mean, it, it opens up broader questions that transcend the, 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 certainly the fast food worker issue. I mean, why did, didn't some in labor do more to distinguish themselves in solidarity with the rebellion in Ferguson? Is that not a part of our class? If you look of who was demonstrating in the streets of Ferguson, they look a lot like the people who work at Burger King. You know? 
And, you know, why wasn't there a labor caravan? You know, uh, 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 Sarah was talking about, you know, trucks being lined up, you know, to go into Donetsk with, with water and blankets. I don't like to see some laborers going down to Ferguson with, with water and medicine and legal observers and blankets and stuff to wet your face, you know, to fight the tear gas. And, 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 and maybe, you know, how about, a, how about labor calling a, a day of labor solidarity with Ferguson, you know, justice for Michael Brown, stop police murder, you know, and there being labor demonstrations in every city. Who's to stop them from doing it? It would be wonderful. It's, 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 it's a political problem. That's not their orientation. The same could be said about what they do and don't do with respect to immigrants and how they needed to fully embrace immigrants, not just support some bad, you know, reform, uh, but find a way to bring millions of immigrant workers, regardless of their legal status, into the ranks of the labor movement as official card-carrying unionists. If they wanted to do it, there would be a way to do it. If they don't, talk to a couple of our comrades. They'll give them some imaginative ideas of how to do it or get around this and that. The question for us comrades, as we ponder these problems that I'm raising, we don't have time to deal with the answers, is, is there going to be a new revolutionary development within the working class that will ultimately transform and radicalize the working class. And when is it going to happen? I cannot give you specific answers as to when and how. I might have some ideas, that's another question. But I can give you an answer that I'm absolutely certain of. Our participation will be decisive. That's the part of the answer I know. What we do or fail to do is going to be very important in the process of reorganizing and radicalizing the working class movement. So it's not just a bunch of detachments of our class fighting all sorts of battles alone, but more and more the class struggle will resemble a class-wide battle where our class has no boundaries, no language limitations, no cultural boundaries. We're all together on this planet, not only giving symbolic solidarity, but sometimes effective and decisive solidarity. Because that's what the capitalism that John began describing when he first started talking, that's what this stage of capitalism demands of the working class. In the immediate future, we have some ideas about the steps that need to be taken forward. We haven't talked about it a lot, I think, during the summer here. And maybe that's because we've been so preoccupied with, with Gaza, and the, the tremendous demonstrations, very necessary, uh, the Ukraine, uh, uh, then Ferguson, which of course, you know, that's a worldwide question. Uh, we haven't talked about some of the stuff that we've been working on nationally and locally. Um, I think most of you know that as of a few months ago, we've been targeting the so-called World Business Forum uh, taking place at Radio City Music Hall on October 7th and 8th. And uh, the plan is we've got a demonstration at 4 p.m. Uh, at Radio C City Music Hall on October 8th against this meeting. This is, a, this is going to be the largest meeting of CEOs, chief executive officers, heads of corporations, heads of the Fortune 500 corporations, Monsanto, the oil companies, all of them, Duke Power, you know, this is going to be the biggest meeting of those types anywhere this year. It's, it's not the first one, I think it's about the third or fourth one, but they've been doing some stealth thing, trying to have them kind of, not secretly, but, you know, just see if they can get away without you know, provoking the, the movement. So we have targeted this.
And while we're raising a lot of issues, Gaza, Ferguson especially, the key issue that we're raising to these bosses, these people who decide how many hundreds or thousands of workers are fired, or whether or not we should go after a union and go after their health benefits and go after their, their uh, retirement. These are the people who are going to be sitting in those chairs in Radio City Music Hall. What we're going to bring to their face, into their face, the 1%, is the question of low-wage workers, a minimum of $15 an hour, and the right to a union. And we're going to stamp it on them like stamping a tail on a donkey or a tail on a nose, you know, in front of Radio City Music Hall. Uh, and everything that we're doing from this point on, this fall, uh, to a large extent, is geared toward that. Uh, on, um, on September 17th, which is the third anniversary of the Occupy movement, there's going to be a major third anniversary in Sakati Park. Uh, the, uh, the forces that are organizing it are the forces that we work with in the People's Power Assembly, OccuEvolve and some of the veterans of Occupy. We have no a sense of the size of it, how many veterans of Occupy will come. But uh, it, it is interesting and, and flattering, I think, that the main event that they decided uh, to commemorate the anniversary was to have a people's and workers assembly in the evening at Sakati Park, after which there might be a march to Wall Street. They'll see. And so I want people to put that on their calendar uh, September 17th, in the evening, I think it's 7-ish, a People's and Workers' Assembly. We're going to try to get a lot of our trade union friends there. We're going to try to get a lot of our community friends. That, that's the night we usually have our PPA meeting, but we're not going to have it that night. That night, instead of the PPA right here in this uh, room, we're going to be in Sakati Park at the People's and Workers' Assembly. And the main thing on the agenda is going to be planning, I think, for two things. One is the World Business Forum, and the other thing is the Climate March. The Climate March will probably be the biggest protest this fall. It takes place in conjunction with the UN Conference on Climate and several other events uh, dealing with you know, the, the, the environment and the climate question. It's on Saturday, September 22nd? Sunday, September. Su Sunday, September 21st. Uh, Sunday, September 21st. Sunday, September 21st. Could be between 100,000 and a quarter of a million, you know. And a lot of people are focused on it. A lot of money's in it. It's got political problems. I'm sure that you are not surprised. The demand is not to put the CEOs in jail, you know, 100% end of emissions and, uh, uh, and, and really an end of capitalism. If, if they wanted to be true, it should be a march against capitalism. Actually, what has happened is that uh, quite a few corporations have pumped resources into it, and they've sort of co-opted it. And they made it into a come by our march, let's all be concerned about the environment, and then let's go home. You know? And they're not even marching any place. They're, they're, they're assembling in Columbus uh, Circle. Uh, they're marching around downtown, and then they're ending up for some reason on uh, uh, 40, some, what is it? A vacant lot. A vacant lot on 11th <laughs> Avenue. Yeah, you know. Was that the, the Javits Center or something like that? You know. 40, 42nd. Uh, 42nd and, and 11th Avenue. They're not going to the UN. They're not going to the Koch brothers who, who are on like 60th Street in Madison or something like that. You know, uh, and uh, they're just trying to dumb, dumb it down. You know, what a sinister, you know, nauseating thing, you know. But, and, and, and you know, we, we're paying attention to it even more than we were now that it's a few weeks away. Uh, because there are militant forces and we want to know what they want to do. Uh, but we know two things. Uh, one is that, one thing, this will be the biggest opportunity for those who are building the World Business Forum protests to get that message out to a section of the movement, uh, uh, you know, short of doing it over uh, uh, social media. 
because there'll be so many people there. And we're going to try to come up with some special literature that addresses uh, 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 climate change. It is an important issue. People are coming from all over the world, from Bolivia, from Venezuela, from you know Indonesia. I mean, it's, it's a big event in spite of its terrible leadership and you know, eviscerated politics. But think about how important bringing the protests of the World Business Forum is there. Unlike that protest, the World Business Forum on October 8th is a class struggle up and down. It's a struggle against CEOs. It's a struggle against the 1%. No buffer, no nothing. We're taking it right to them. And so anyone at that, at that uh, uh, climate march who is frustrated and who wants to take it to the bosses, we have the solution for them, at least, you know, in terms of October. And there'll probably be more, more things coming out of October 8th that we'll discuss in good time.